Welcome to another edition of the Dogger Pass Podcast. This for UFC Paris. Uh, producer Megan on the sticks. Cody Safdick back on thex.com after many complaints to, uh, to Elon is on the line. Congratulations, Cody. I didn't think you were ever going to get it back. I thought I was going to have to give you the Dogger Pass uh, account there. Yeah, and, yeah, and I honestly thought about it. I was like, I don't want the dog to pass account. I think I'm just going to quit. But it also pained me deep inside. But I'm such a stubborn person, the most stubborn person, that I was just going to go out on my shield on this one. Uh, anyways, they hit me up, and they were like, nothing we can do to help you. Sorry. Try again some other time. We can't verify these things. And, you know, try making a new account. So then that just pisses me off even more. I'm like, definitely not making a new account. Screw these guys. And you know who comes through in the clutch out of nowhere? Matt Lee, longtime Fight Network employee, longtime mm-hmm. Dogger Pass and Bookie Beatdown supporter. He finds this dope workaround. I can't get too much in detail because it sounds half like you could use it to scam stuff. But <laughs> it's like basically you pay 10 bucks and he's like able to intercept the email and uh, intercepted the email of the code that I needed to change my password. And then I changed my password. Wow. So mad shout out to Matt Lee coming through, coming through. And again, I didn't actually reach out to him and, and, and say anything. I should have. He just took it upon himself, dude. He just took it upon himself. Went out, delivered. So my dude, big, big appreciation goes out there. Funny story. I was talking to Pat about your Twitter account maybe like a week ago, 10 days ago, something like that. And he said that he had talked to Matt Lee. And when he asked oh, Matt Lee, maybe, what was the light? Okay. He, he asked Matt Lee, what was the likelihood of Cody getting it back? And he said, oh, he's screwed. So somewhere <laughs> along the lines, he figured out, how to blur the lines, I suppose. Um, let's get into the action. I mean, this episode of the Dogger Pass podcast and all episodes of the Dogger Pass podcast are brought to you by Prize Picks. Use promo code DOP when making a new account to get a match up to $100 on your first deposit. Cyril Gone takes on Sergey Spivak in the main event. Cyril Gone, a minus 160 favorite. Spivak can be had for plus 140. Cyril Gone is an elite of an elite. Striker, and when he's in there against other guys that don't tend to uh, to you know play the wrestling game against him, he looks as such. He looks like one of the best guys in the world. John Jones absolutely exposed him, but we could see the writing on the wall in the Francis Ngannou fight. Frankie Murderov, a guy that we never really thought had any sort of massive grappling chops, maybe a little like takedown defense, but like takedown offense on a bum knee. Really, once you kind of saw that, you're like, okay, this guy's got a lot of holes in his game. Now he's going into the fire against a rising prospect in uh, Sergey Spivak, who has been looking really good, and his game plan is tried, tested, and true. It's like he's moving forward, he's trying to take you down, and he is not going to spend too much time on the feet. I think we have a live underdog here. I know we are in, in Paris, France. And if this fight stays on the feet, Spivak doesn't have a chance. Don't get me wrong whatsoever. I think he's going to get it to the ground at plus 140. I'm interested. And then I even see at like one sports book that I don't have access to, but a lot of Americans do. Um, and it was a former, uh, you know, a former sponsor of this program. Um, I think they got Spivak by sub at plus 800. I would definitely be tickling that if I had access to it. I'll see what becomes available to me. But yeah, Spivak and Spivak by sub. I think like if he takes him down there, maybe he grounds and pounds him. He's not exactly a massive submission specialist, but I think Gon's really out of his element as long as this fight goes to the mat. So I'm gonna go for I'm gonna go with the dog, the big upset in Paris, France, um, in Sergey Spivak. What about you? Yeah, man, honestly, I agree with 90% of what you're saying. I think that it's a live underdog situation. Clearly, Gon struggles with takedowns. He's 45% takedown defense in the UFC. He went four for five against Francis Ngannou. And you mentioned it, a bum knee and a non-wrestler. Four for five. It was like there was little resistance to those takedown defense, uh, to those uh, to those opportunities to maybe stay upright. The John Jones fight, it's two for two. You know, Jones is a great wrestler, but again, he's a 205-er that hasn't fought in years. Looked terrible his last time out against Dominic Reyes, who's no longer even 
irrelevant in the division. So there was a lot to like about Gone in that fight. He made zero improvements to his takedown defense. So I think Spivak can have the opportunities to go out there, land takedowns, threaten those submissions. He had six takedowns last time out against Derek Lewis, six takedowns this time before that against Augusto Sakai, three against Craig Hardy. I think the guy's getting a lot better, and he's still only 28 years old. He's a baby by heavyweight standards. So you're seeing natural improvements out of him. You're also seeing physical improvements out of him. Last time out, he weighs 255 pounds, right? Joan Jones, not a real heavyweight, but again, when he tipped the ski, it was at 248. So now if you're gone, you are taking a bigger, stronger man with good wrestling and good grappling. Gone's low-key, 33 years old, still young by heavyweight standards. But again, if the grappling is not improving and they keep matching him up with these grapplers, it's not going to go good. That's kind of one of the situations that we're falling in here. So I think it's live underdog. To me, though, the reason why I just like I couldn't quite get there is the five-round nature of it. I think Spivak can get the takedowns. I think Spivak can do some work. But he's most definitely out of his element in the stand department. You agree. If mm-hmm. this fight stays standing... He's going to get beat up. His chin's also not that good. Like you've seen in his fights, like the Tom Aspinall fight, even Alexei Olenek was hurting him standing. The guy's not very comfortable in these stand-up exchanges. He relies on getting takedowns. But you can get six takedowns against Derek Lewis. Even Lewis is exploding and getting up. Even Lewis is scrambling and getting back to his feet. So if Gon can do the same thing, get up. Make him work for it. Extend this into those later rounds. I think Spivak tires out. Once he tires out, he's not going to get those takedowns. And once he doesn't get those takedowns and he's forced to strike, I got a feeling Gon just beats him down the stretch. So Gon's got a lot to prove here. And clearly his coaches should know what they need to work on. Will it be enough? I don't know. But he's quite literally fighting in his own backyard. And the five rounds, I think, is going to be really key. So what I would offer up is I am going to bet Thrill Gone. He's definitely not going to be at the top of the PRPs this week because I, I'm not super confident in it. But the best way to approach this as a Gone better would be the live bet. Live bet. I might get plus money on it. At the very least, I might get a better price than open if he loses the first round or two and is getting out grappled, but can pull it off down the stretch. So that's kind of how I see it going. Spivak's unproven cardio, traveling into enemy territory, taking on a guy that fights five rounds all day, right? Like he paces himself extremely well. His cardio is very good. So he's going to have problems. And again, he's not the most durable guy standing. So if he doesn't get those takedowns, it's not going to be great for him. End picks, real gone. Completely agree. Close fight and live underdog. I will correct myself from something I said earlier that Spivak by submission, I think I was looking at the wrong thing. I think I was looking on fightodds.com. I was looking like a bar down. So it's the best on market is plus 500, which I which I still, I think it's mo- it's his most likely path to victory. So no, a plus 800, I do not believe have existed anywhere. Not yet in the week. And I would be pretty surprised if anybody gives you much better than the plus 500 uh, uh, on that matter. All right, moving on down. We got Menon Fioro taking on Rose Namajunas. Minus, one, f- minus 170 for Fioro. Plus 150 for Thug Rose. I mean, it's really tough to get a read on, t- on Thug Rose. Sometimes she, I mean, she was obviously the former champion. Sometimes she just looks like an absolute world beater. This fight is at flyweight, so she's giving up a bunch of size. Um, I mean, if she ha- if she tries to play this fight like she did against Esparza, well, this ain't Esparza. You're dealing with a much better striker who's going to be excellent at range. It's going to have you outmatched in terms of, uh, of reach, I would imagine. And an ability to just hang out at that range. Um, maybe Manon Fioro can mix in some takedowns as well. But yeah, it's it's hard to back Rose after after that Carla fight. It's like she did nothing. There was really nothing going on in that fight. And at the end of the fight, she kind of acted like like oh, we did we followed the game plan. It's like the game plan was to do basically nothing for five rounds. The game pl- the victory felt like I didn't get taken down, so I won. But she ended up losing one of the worst, uh, you know, one of the most boring fights of all time. Well, she loses the decision there. Um, I I wouldn't be stunned to see Rose pull off an upset here, but. I don't really like, I don't think, you know, she's never really been too huge at, at straw weight. I don't really like her moving up here in France against a French fighter. Could see it being relatively close, but the pick will be Manon Fioro for me. What about you? 
Yeah, I'm going to have to, again, agree with everything you're saying. Only the pick is going to be the exact same as Yumino Fioro. Uh, she's bigger and stronger, and I think that's going to be the real key here. Of course, it'd be nice just to wait until weigh-ins and see what Rose looks at 125. But to me, here's somebody that's gone to the most highs of the highs. Like, everybody that's familiar with Rose Nalmunis' story has known that she's seen some things and been through some stuff. But then professionally in her career, gets on the ultimate fighter and gets all the way to the finals, fights for the first ever title against Carlos Sparza and loses. Like, it's a huge high and then a huge low. She goes back to contender mode, slowly works her way back up the ranks, ends up winning a world title, loses the world title, wins the world title, loses the world title. And the last fight was just god-awful. So at, at 33 years old in a weight class that is built on just speed and aggression and needing to go for it. You can't just kind of get lazy. And I'm not saying she got lazy. I just, I don't know that she's as motivated as she once was. The fight with Carlos Esparza was there for the taking, right? Instead, she fights, like you said, a counter game plan. Maybe just stay on the outside, stuff the takedowns. Did get taken down twice, but for the most part, yeah, her takedown defense looked okay. Her grappling looked okay. She just was unwilling to engage. She has massive, massive striking advantages, over Carla Esparza, okay? She knocked out Zhang Wiley once upon a time with a head kick. Okay. She's 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 been there and she's done that. She's one of the she was one of the great champions. And like just super reluctant to throw anything of note. Now she's been off a full year and now she's moving up a weight class. Like it's just all really uninspiring. She got the back class to do it. She got the back class to get it done. And one could maybe imagine Rose's offensive wrestling could be a key here. Minofi Rowe hasn't really fought a whole lot of grapplers, at least not a whole lot of wrestlers. And she did get taken down once by Jennifer Maya. Again, not a whole lot of people have even really attempted to take her down because she's strong and she's agile and hard to get a read on. But Rose at her best could definitely get this fight to the ground. If she's on top, why could she not score some good top control? Kill time away at the clock. Edge this one out. It's all there for the taking. But again, it's the moving up a weight class is going to be a problem because now Minofi Rho could never make 115. Not going to happen. She's a strong flyweight. Taking her down is going to be problematic. Holding her down is going to be problematic. So chances are you're going to have to sit there and strike. And she's just, you know, she's quick. She's fleet-footed. She did to, cha to Caitlin Chikagian what Caitlin Chikagian's done to so many other top contenders in the division. She's hard to get a read on, and she just excels with her kicking game. She's got the French crowd behind her. They're desperate to have her win this fight and then challenge for a world title. So that's the clear narrative here, and I would think even if she just keeps it close and competitive, she probably wins. But I see this predominantly being a striking affair. Rose throws in a couple takedowns because she doesn't want to strike here and there. Sure, Minot's got to stuff them. And then get it done, you know? Would a guy like Pat Mayo be interested in that plus money? Maybe, because he's got a lot of back class on championship status, Rose Namajunas. To me, it's just like the peripherals just aren't quite there. I can't quite get there. So uh, I'm going to go Firo. A five-round fight, you know, again, interesting because Rose could make it happen. But a three-round fight, I think she just struggles to get her timing going because of the year-long the year -long layoff. Struggles to find that early time, that early rhythm, falls behind two rounds, maybe tries to bid a comeback in the third, gets that takedown. But Mano Firo's submission defense is pretty solid. So uh at least at least 29-28, hopefully a 30-27. Yeah. And, uh, sounds like we're on the same page there. Moving on down, we've got Benoit Saint Denis taking on Tiago Moises, minus 150 for Benoit Saint Denis. Plus 130 for Moises. Who you got? So I think I'm now officially a Benoit Saint-Denis believer. You tried to give me the heads up last time out that you think this guy's actually pretty good. And that uh, dude, you're onto something. He's like a French paratrooper, strong as a ox. And he makes his debut against Aleski, uh, Zaleski. I always pronounce this guy's name wrong. Elizu Zaleski de Santos, right? And it's just like an absolute banger of a fight. He gets... He gets mauled on, and he eats some absolutely monstrous shots. He got landed 149 to 67 and was gassed pretty much six minutes into the fight. But boy, oh boy, this had guy had two things you can't teach, which is heart, heart for days, and just like mad durability. So if you're willing to work with him, because he's still fairly young, he can wrestle. He's very hard-nosed, and the guy's got decent power in his hands. So if you can be one of these pressure fighters, stay in the pocket, you don't have to have the greatest technique. You just have to have the desire. You will break down the fancier, more athletic fighter more often than not. So UFC's done a fairly good job of matching him up. He gets uh, Nicholas Stoltz, smashes Nicholas Stoltz, takes him down, ragdolls him, submission, second round submission. The Gabriel Miranda fight, three knockdowns he scores over Gabriel Miranda, ends up knocking him out in the second round. Brilliant performance. 
Last time out against Ishmael Bonfim, that's where I kind of pulled back. Now, live underdog status for sure. A lot of sharps did read that at the very least, this man will fight for your dollar and give you the best of his abilities to try and win and cash for you. And uh, man, again, he's very physically strong. He goes out there, he just rough dolls Bonfim to the ground, faced some early strikes, got in there. I like him. I like him. Back in the day, you used to get these Darren Elkin types. You used to get these, you know, a prime Jim Miller types. Uh, uh, what was his? Uh, b bunch of good guys, right? Nowadays, it's like, who are those grinders that are going to grind away at you and go out there and get the, that job done, that Nick Lenz type performance? And that's what I like about him. I always like getting behind them because they're going to fight for your dollar. They're going to give you the best of their abilities. He's in his own home territory, so the fans will be behind him. The fans at home are already behind him, and he fights for it. So a lot that you can like from St. Denis. Tiago Moises probably on paper seems just like more skilled. He's a Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt, so on paper his grappling is better. And his striking, well, he's been working on an American top team, and you know he's hung in there with a few guys, but here's what I don't like about him. Fight to fight, you never really see a whole lot of improvements. The guy that you saw years ago is kind of the guy you see now. Still talented, but not really evolving, not adding different wrinkles to his game. When they match him up against pure strikers, he doesn't do good. Michael Johnson was piecing him up. He gets lucky with that second round submission. It happens to Michael Johnson all the time. Bobby Green, Bobby Green's piecing him up the entire fight. He gets lucky. He gets a robbery decision victory over Bobby Green. Joel Alvarez, Joel Alvarez, not even really a striker. He's more of a grappler for the most part. He just mad dogs him, gets in his face, smashes him with a bunch of elbows, all stuff that Benoit Saint-Denis is very likely to do here, and he takes him out. And then his last fight there is that Milk Costa. Milk Costa won the first round. He outstruck him. In the second round, you can see Milk Costa start to fade because he's on short notice against a dude that's got 12 fights in the UFC and he's making his debut. Like, sure, Moises wins those fights. He could teach a young fighter a lesson or two. But against, like, top contenders, guys that really want it, uh, it's going to be a problem. Now, how can St. Denis win this fight? Well, again, I think if it stays standing, he's got more power. He's going to stand in his face. He should lend more volume. But he can actually sneak in a few takedowns. Like, his submission defense isn't bad. And when you say Moises is a black belt, this and that, well, what's he going to do? Catch him in a triangle choke? Catch him in an arm bar? Like, it's 2023. Men's MMA 2023. Like, you're not catching a guy in a triangle choke unless he's, like, a, a bottom 10 guy of the division. And St. Denis not that guy. So I think you can just win striking exchanges, pressure him forward, land the bigger shots, mix in takedowns, probably win a decision. Might knock him out. Joel Alvarez did it, but probably likely wins the decision. Yeah, I'm with you for the most part there. Uh, my only thing is that, like, last time out against Bonfim at plus 220 was, like, the time to hop on the train. This is a, def a difficult fight. Like, the grappling is I expect this fight actually probably to take place mostly on the feet. I agree with you that he could take him down, and he's got good enough jujitsu to hang out and, you know, maybe steal some rounds, seal some rounds uh, that way. But it's like, I don't know if that's going to be entirely the game plan. I think the game plan is going to be be an absolute assassin, be a maniac, be up in his face, and force Moises to fight. Because a lot of his opponents... Yeah, he really slows down the pace of a lot of his fights. Like it's very ticky tacky, making sure you know, like you're le exchanging leg kicks. Like I don't know if Benoit Saint Denis is going to fight that fight. He hasn't really shown to be that guy. Like against Elijah Zaleski dos Santos, he just stood literally in the pocket and like ate tons of shots on short notice. It was obviously a bad performance by him, but it's like he just stood there, just took all of the damage. And was giving some good stuff back. Um, that's why on prize picks, 44.5 significant strikes. It, like, if you look at some of, like, Moises' previous opponents, like, it doesn't look great. But, like, I expect this to probably at least get into the third round. And I think if it gets, you know, if we get past 10 minutes of a fight, 44.5, I think that's a very manageable number for Benoit Saint-Denis to get past uh, on prizepicks.com. Um, but yeah, I'm with you. I, I, I'm I'm picking Benoit Saint Denis. I think Benoit Saint Denis by decision. There's some money coming in on the under two and a half rounds, but and I guess Benoit Saint Denis by knockout is definitely in play. I just see these guys kind of go into decision. I think um, Moises is, Moises has been cracked. He has been knocked out. Don't get me wrong, but Chin has held up against some good opponents. And when he's getting finished, he's been getting finished like against like the Islam Makachevs of the world so uh benoit saint denis by decision what is that prop 
plus 225 plus 350 is the best on market right now i like that all right moving on down we've got vulcan uzdemir taking on bogdan guskov vulcan is minus 180 guskov is plus 155 who you got code yeah, dude, I honestly, I, I don't know. I don't know. Like, the logical pick is very clearly Volkan Uzdemir. But again, dude, you see week in, week out, every UFC card, these greasy underdogs coming through. And a large majority of the time, it's some greasy underdog making his debut who it's like, ah, he's fought a bunch of cans on the regional scene, and now he's fighting the UFC. And now he's fighting a guy that's fought for world title and fought 10 times, a Volkan Uzdemir type and they, it just doesn't matter. It's like changing of the guard type stuff. So why can't Bogdan go out there and, and spring the upset? Well, he can. And if you're playing fantasy type MMA where you're relying on a guy to get a first round finish, Bogdan's probably your guy. He's going to be great value. And his win condition is likely a first round finish. When you see him on the regional scene, Paul, like he's fighting guys kind of, not half his size, like they're heavyweights, but <laughs> they're, this is not great competition. And he beats the crap out. Can't really grapple to my knowledge. Like his grappling doesn't look anything spectacular, but it's just like, like he'll just come forward. He has a nasty right hand on him, decent timing, athletic guy, 30 years old. So again, still young for the heavyweight division. And he just, or I guess 205 pound division, but he's just like curling these guys over, man. How good is he? How good is he? How, how can how can you really tell? You know, has he faced a whole lot of resistance? No, not really. Has he been matched up properly for the majority of his career? No, not really. But he's here now, and he's dangerous. He's dangerous because he could definitely go out there and just blast you. And so with Volkan Uzdemir, he does, doesn't seem all that like interested lately. The thing is, is he fights world-class competition. He's always fought world-class competition. And if you were to match Bogdan Guskov against Nikita Krylov, Paul Craig, Magomed Ankalaev, Yuri Pokraska, Alexander Rakic, hell, even Ilir Latifi, Dominic Reyes, Anthony Smith. The guy would be 0 and 7. You know, he would he would not beat any of those guys. So on one hand, it's like Volkan, he's been struggling, but he, he fights world class guys. Guskov just can crushes. He's a live opponent. He's live because it's a fist fight. And anybody can win a fist fight. And again, Volkan's going to have to mind his P's and Q's. Also, no time Volkan, he's not that guy anymore. He hasn't knocked out an opponent in four years. He's mostly just in these decision-type fights where he's super low volume, doesn't seem interested. His speed's not quite there. His counters aren't quite there. But he does train at an elite level with an elite gym and has great training partners. He's super experienced. And I think he could point away and maybe win, like, a decision-type fight. But then Guskov, on the other hand, is not going to be a decision. Either he's going to wreck him or he's going to die trying. So... He's he's live in that sense for sure, but I think the smart play is the veteran. Maybe that's why I lose all these picks week in and week out because it's like I I'm expecting something out of Volkan Uzdemir, whereas Guskov's a wild card and you know he's still a dangerous banger, man. So again, you can check out his record all you want. You can check out his highlights. Like you know he he's a threat. It's just I don't. If Volkan was fighting those guys, he'd probably be no time Volkan again. Taking out guys in 30 seconds, like it ain't no thing. It's that jumping competition he couldn't handle. That jumping competition, I can't say Guskov can't handle it because I just haven't seen anything. But to me, he looks like just a bully. Like a guy that's had his way on the regional scene, hasn't ha faced a whole lot of adversity. Even Sergei Pavlovich. Sergei Pavlovich, who's a total badass, was just wrecking cans. They gave him Alistair Overeem in his debut. A terrible debut. And he got wrecked. He got wrecked. Then he learned. Then he got better. Guskov might be the exact same. But he might get wrecked in that first fight before he goes back to the drawing board and figures out what he needs to do to improve. So I guess I will go Volkan Uzdemir. But again, if you were forced to pull some underdogs here and there, you know, Guskov's a guy that's at least considered live, in my opinion. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's tough. Because Volkan, obviously, last time out against... Uh, Krylov getting taken out seven times like that performance was just like mind-blowing because we bring up oh he's training at a good gym oh he's got like all of these looks and stuff and just like he got mauled by a guy who like started this game as a karate guy right um he thought he was gonna stand with him man it was not part of the game plan I guess but it's you're supposed to be a veteran you're supposed to be able if you're a veteran you're supposed to be able to adapt the game plan I this one scares me I'm going to pick o Uzdemir with you, but it, like, it kind of reminds me of the situation with that uh, Nur Sultan Ruzabelov guy, 
where it's just like, yeah, he was fighting mm, a whole bunch badass. of cans. <laughs> he was fighting a whole bunch of cans or a bunch of people who were like pretty low on him. He had, a, you know, some questionable losses on his career. And then the guy shows up and just absolutely just crushes. Um, Guskov has at least first round knockout potential. If you're playing like daily fantasy sports on, on, on any of the other sites, um, he's probably going to be like a low owned, high upside kind of guy in like GPP tournaments and stuff like that. I think that's an interesting little side to it there, but, uh, I'm with you. I'll go with, I can't even call him old faithful cause he, he's definitely cost me a whole bunch of money. He, he won me money against Paul Craig, and then he just completely lost all credibility against Krylov. He fought the, fight, the smart fight against Paul Craig, just like, do not engage on the ground by any stretch of the imagination, and you win this fight. He, did, he fought that fight really smart. And then, yeah, it was really ugly against Krylov. So uh, I won't be betting the minus 180, but uh, I'll be picking him with you. We got William Gomez taking on Giannis Gamuri. Minus 250 for Gomez, plus 215 for Gamori. There's been like a big shakeup on a bunch of these fights over the over the last couple of days with people dropping out and they took one guy from one fight and threw him in another. It's a bit of it's a bit of pandemonium, Cody. But like Gomez lost his opponent. So then Gamori was supposed to fight at 135 against Kalen Lochran, I believe. But now he's fighting at 145 against Gomez. Uh, who you got here? Yeah, so to break down the first four fights of this card, dude, you got Gon versus Spivak, a dope heavyweight fight with actual, you know, title implications, some meaning to it. Mino Fioro versus Rose Namajunas, super high level, two of the better girls. Rose, a former champion, a well-known name coming up a weight class. Benoit Saint-Denis, massive fan favorite, proven. Thiago Moises, been or been there, done that. Definitely got something to show. Nice fight. Volcan, who, who's not down with Volcan, former title challenger. And this wild card, Bogdan Guskov, would be a fun fight. And at the rest of the card from here, it's a Cage Warriors card. This is oh, a yeah. straight up Cage Warriors card. So we don't have to talk a whole lot about no. it. But yeah, th 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 there's definitely an advantage there that Giannis is coming up. Giannis is very sharp. He's definitely like a, a good counter striker, has some legitimate striking. Also, he's. 28 years old but he's got 10 years in the game dog this guy started fighting pro at 18 years old paid his dues fought some legitimate guys i think he's got a win over amin ayub in like ayub's second pro fight back in 2014 so like he's definitely matured and turned into a solid little fighter and at 135 you know maybe he could be a tough little davy grant type or uh, uh, he's, he's actually a good sharp little counter striker i like him i like him in that regard but the fights get scrapped, and having Taylor Lapolis on the card is very important to them because it's, it's return to the UFC. He's as big as a star in France as you can get for a guy that doesn't fight in the UFC anymore. Like he's super proven. He's won all those titles, and they need to keep him on the card. Likewise, Giannis Girmuri, he's gonna fight whoever. He just wants to be on the card in front of his friends and family. He wouldn't be in the UFC probably otherwise, if not for the fact that they're in France. So you'll take whatever he's jumping up. So he's at a natural disadvantage jumping up to 145. The thing with William Gomez, and William Gomez is not, he's going to be prone to losing these tight decisions. And if you look at Gear Moody, I think two of his last four wins are by split decision. So this has the making of like a close, probably low output fight that you just, you need the judges to be on the right side of it. If you're taking Gomez, who I am going to take, He's minus 300, man. So for a fight that's very likely going to decision, and this one's very likely going to decision, you're going to need good judges. So just keep that in mind, man. Minus 300's got apple pie shader written all over it. Again, for Gomez, though, what he does have is like it's a it's a cancerous style. It's cancerous to entertainment, man. He just He's in and out. He's very lateral. He's super hard to get a hold of, and then he mixes in takedowns. So you're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. If you just stand there, He's just going to pot shot at you, and he's gone out of dodge before you can even counter. If you decide to just march him down, he just backpedals, 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 shoot and mix in that takedown. It's very hard to deal with, but it doesn't actually yield a whole lot of output. It's mostly just a tactical way to win a fight. So you need judges to value that more than the bigger shots because he's not landing a whole lot of bigger shots. And his fight with Jaro, uh, Yaro Ahrens, a very limited grappler from the Netherlands. Again, he mixes in the three takedowns. That's what wins him the fight. But Aaron's almost catches him in a sub in the third round. He only landed outlanded him 32 to 20 over the course of 15 minutes. So low output, mixes in the takedowns, ends up winning uh, 
I think it was a unanimous decision or a majority decision, but like not, he definitely won the first two, but it's a close fight, man, because he just doesn't do a whole lot. Then that fight with Francis Marshall, it's a nice little win. Francis Marshall hasn't exactly aged well in the UFC to this point, but again, it's a nice little win. But what do you like about it? He's backpedaling. He outstrikes him 27 to 16, and he gives up the two takedowns and almost gets submitted in the third round. So again, it's another situation of he starts off early. It's hard to figure out what this guy's going to do. And then eventually they do figure it out. He ends up winning a split decision on another low output fight. So you've got 32 strikes landed in your first one, 27 strikes landed in your second one. You're going to get screwed on a decision at some point. And I get Gary Moody's coming up from 135, but he can strike. He's a decent striker. And if he just stands there and waits for you to bob in, tries to counter off you, keep the fight upright, he could spring the upset. But I think because he's a 35 or going up to 45, Gomez probably will get the takedowns. And if he does get the takedowns, he's going to do the same thing he did to these last two guys, which is just go up two rounds early and coast in the third. Who cares if he loses the third? He's probably not even caring to win the third because he knows he's up two rounds. Gomez is the type of guy that the second he loses his first fight in the UFC or his second fight in the UFC, he gone. Just like Jared Rochal. Jared Rochal was 6-2 and two in the UFC. Arjan Bular was like 3-1 and one in the UFC. Isn't that a good style? It's not an entertaining style. They're in France, so they're going to throw him out there. So I guess I take FICO's the decision, first of all. You know, the over 2.5. Go miss if you're going to take him. I think you take him by decision because he ain't trying to finish nothing. But minus 300 is just a terrible price tag, man. So, you know, if I had the cojones, I think I do take Gary Moody. But the moving up the weight class, that's what kind of sealed it for me. So maybe wait to check out weigh-ins, but I'll go Gomez. Gomez missed last time out. He came in at 147. Yeah, one pound. One pound. Yeah. Um, but that's bad. <laughs> that's bad that you couldn't make that one pound. I right? mean, like the Francis Marshall win, which was like hardly even like a win. He like edged it out, split decision, real, real greasy. Incred what is he's had two fights. He had 27 significant strikes in the Francis Marshall fight and 32 in the other. This is not adding up to somebody that I would be willing to pay minus 250 for. Um, the size yeah. would be a bit of a concern, 100%, but I think it's pretty clearly a dog or pass situation here. Um, it, 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 I just, yeah, somebody who throws that little volume. I mean, I guess he had a little bit of wrestling success against Yarno Aarons. We just saw Yarno Aarons over in Singapore this past weekend. It's like pretty, pretty dud performance. Fran, bo both of his wins just recently have looked pretty con like pretty questionable right francis marshall got absolutely starched by isaac dolgarian and then obviously yarno aaron's last week against uh sung Wool Choi. so i don't know i think it's a dogger pass situation here cody i'll be waiting for weigh-ins um but i want to see kind of the these guys standing next to each other maybe i'll i'll uh cower it out at the last minute but maybe gamori 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 Money Line would probably be the safest route. Um, he's got a couple subs on his career, but like it's mostly against like guys with like zero. But what's the price? It's like zero and zero record. There's no props. The, the fight was literally there is no prop. The, the just fight was literally match, made like last night, yeah, like, Tuesday yeah. night, and so they just have money lines. They don't even have totals out for that yet. So I, have, your guess is as good as mine. Um, I mean, hit by decision would be the most likely outcome. And they're both from France, so uh, if the judges want to get a little ha ha ha, I mean, who are they going to? You know, they're they're both French guys, so should be kind of kind of even, wouldn't you think? Yeah, I'm no, saying no, if there's any, right. there's no you know, there's no hometown cooking, there's no hometown ratatouille going on here. Exactly. If there's a ratatouille, um, ratatouille for hooey. Uh, moving on down, we got Morgan Cherrier taking on Manolo Zacchini, minus three thirty for Morgan, plus two seventy for Manolo. Who you got? Yeah, so this is like your quintessential Cage Warriors main event. You know, this is the, definitely something they'd put out there, and I it's not that I don't know. I just I just don't have like any type of real confidence or much of a read. Morgan Sherrier, he's definitely been around the block. You see that in his eighteen and nine and one record. He's fought a bunch of guys, and his biggest thing is he's super inconsistent. Like he's been at it for a long time. He would definitely be considered a veteran, but he'll go on like a decent little run where he'll beat some guys and then a uh, bad little losing streak. And then, oh, back on the win track again, oh, and then back. Currently, he's on one of those winning streaks. But again, he, he's super low output, 
very tentative. I don't know if that's he's got 30 fights. He's just tired of getting banged out of there. But like that seems to be the trend is that these kids coming out of contender series have like seven or eight pro fights and they're fighting these like 20, 30 fight veterans and they, they just want it more. They haven't been hit that as much. Their bodies are fresh and they make it these really dangerous fights. Sherrier seems to be fighting on like a more of a conservative type of approach. So he's winning fights and he's got legitimate skills. Uh, and I think he could win this fight, but at some point, like I need to take some underdogs. And I think he's the kind of guy I would be looking to fade, take advantage of that, that lower output. Now I'll admit he's a better counter puncher and he's got enough power that he, he could definitely not just knock out this Manolo zucchini guy. But uh, I'll tell you what, man, this zucchini, he comes forward. He comes forward. He's willing to engage. He's got some decent power. His last fight against this Abu Tunkara uh, knocks him out with a nasty knee. Like he does have good finishing abilities. I don't necessarily think that he's going to go out there and finish Sherrier, but I just I need him to mix it up, stay in his face, and take advantage of the fact that he's a low volume. Now, it is in France, and if it's French judges, I could be in some serious trouble here because they're going to be behind Sherrier, who's low output, and probably fights his way to a decision versus one guy that's going to be chasing him around, trying to scrap with him. I just have a feeling that Sherrier is going to tire, and counterpunching for 15 minutes is a tough task against a guy that's coming forward. So, again, underdogs are going to come through. I think I'm going to take Zucchini, but like, I don't feel great about this and it's going to be lower down on the list, of course, but got to make a pick somewhere and uh, I'll take Manolo. Well, I don't, I don't step in front of Cody Saftik making dog picks. I'm the guy who just spams underdogs here. So I'll, I'll join the uh, Zucchini front with you. What do you think of this though? Um, prize picks for, you were talking about Morgan with like really, really low volume, 44.5 significant strikes in a fight that's like, Basically a pick them to, you know, to over two and a half. 44 and a half, like, that's super, super low. Like, if these if guys are going to... Are they going to hang insane. out at, at striking range for 12 and a half minutes? Like, it takes a certain type of, like... It takes a, a Carla Esparza versus Rose Namajunas type of performance. Or a uh, Francis Ngannou versus uh, Derek Lewis or any of William Gomez's fights to not get the 44 and a half. I don't know. What do you think? You, you think that's a pass? You can say pass. I mean, it's, it's, it's very likely a pass. Okay. Because you I'll never know. You never know. You never right. know. I don't want to be. I just I don't, don't. I just don't have a ton of confidence. In I'm this just. Fight. I'm just trying to find some prize picks for the peoples here. And uh, if you think it's there's bad. a couple coming up, I like, but I don't know that I like anything on this. Oh, well, we. I don't even think we mentioned you liked Benoit Saint Denis over 1.5 takedowns too, didn't you? Yeah. I don't think. Let me know. just mention. Let me just mention something with this Morgan Sh Sherry okay. Shariai. I guess you'd call him Morgan Shariai, but. Uh -huh. what's best what's okay so he's so again this is this is a great example so this guy's a minus 340 favorite minus 325 favorite it's a massive favorite right and you saw that just like gomez is a massive favorite like paul's saying we were saying gomez is a super low output guy it's gonna be subjective to get screwed on the scorecards and he's a big favorite you're getting the exact same thing out of morgan morgan's just like a super low output guy but read this okay this is his career so he takes this Fight with Martin Artavian, it's a split decision, right? He loses a split decision in that one. Uh, then in 2018, Marko Kovacic, it's a split draw. Ruslan Kamarayev, a majority loss. Soren Bak, who's really not that good. Super one-dimensional, strong. But, you know, like you saw him in Bellator. Like he didn't transition well from European regional scene to actually decent guys. Like, didn't transition at all. But anyways, he lost a majority decision in that. Then he beat Lewis Monarch, fairly low-level European regional scene guy, on a split decision. And then he lost to Jordan Vuk Vucinic, 7-1, on a split decision. Then he lost to Paul Hughes on a majority decision. Then he won over Daniel Zabant on a split decision. And I'm not skipping fights in between for the most part. Like, the, the, these are consecutive. This is like every fight. So he's low output. All of his fights are splits or majorities, or in some case, draws. And they're trying to feed you him in a UFC debut for minus 325. So, like, it seems like it's just a mass trap line. I'm almost tempted in just betting against Gomez and Sherrier for the chance that if one of them loses, it would still be worth my money. So, one of them's going to lose, and I picked Gomez. So, I'm hoping he wins, and Sherrier is the one that takes the drink.
All right, fair enough. All right, we got Taylor Lapolis taking on Kowlin Lagren. Minus 160 for Lapolis, plus 140 for Lochran. Lochran was supposed to take on Giannis Gomuri, and he was minus 320. So Lapolis, I have noticed, you know, looking through his uh, his topology. He's got some decent wins recently. Obviously, this guy was already previously in the UFC. Had a couple decent wins, went 3-1 and one in the promotion, and then got cut probably because maybe he asked for too much money. I don't know. But uh, wins over Wilson Heiss and Nate Maness, like those are pretty quality wins on the regional scene. Um, I'm just kind of surprised that like Locker Room was supposed to be a massive favorite. And then now it's, you know, now he's a, a decent size underdog against Taylor Lapolis here. Who you got? Yeah, well, it'd be hard to go against Taylor Lapolis. So again, Lapolis is kind of a bigger name on the. <laughs> the French MMA scene and like the dudes absolutely paid his dues. He made his UFC debut back in 2015 against Rocky Lee. Oh my God. Rocky Lee was a one and done. Never fought in the UFC again, but like just super low level fight and he wins it by decision. Didn't look like he has much finishing ability from there. He beat Alka Sasaki. Uh, he lost to Eric Perez. He lost, he won against Leandro Issa and with a three and one record, they caught him. They released him from the promotion. So it was always puzzling why a guy that was three and one did have one knockout win. Didn't seem to have the most exciting style, but why would you why would you cut him? You need band and weights. There's a lot of great band and weights out there. So he had a lot of public support behind him in that this guy should be in the UFC. And that's eight years ago. Eight years ago, it took him to get his way back in. And since then, he's done everything that you would really need a guy to go do. You know, he beat a guy like Josh Hill. He beat Nate Maness, finished him in TKO for the title. Nate Maness goes on to fight in the UFC. I think he's had six fights in the UFC. Where's Taylor's shot, right? Beat Wilson Hayes. Wilson Hayes fought a, a, a world title against Demetrius Johnson. BJJ Black Belt, 45 veteran, super tough nose. Has to beat a guy like that on the regional scene. He's paid his dues. He's done that. And, and now it just seems... He's probably coming into his own, if not kind of right at the tail end. But he's still only 31 years old. At Bantamweight, it's a division that needs a whole lot of speed. And he's got speed. He's got excellent kicks. He's an excellent uh, defensive fighter. Doesn't get hit a whole lot. Fights extremely high ring IQ. Can mix in his takedowns. Defensive grappling seems to be there. Cardio in a three-round fight is going to be there. Why wouldn't you like Taylor Lapolis? Now, now Laukren, there's a lot to like at kind of on paper, right? Because it, it looks really good. As an amateur, he was... 8-2. and two. As a pro, he's undefeated 8-0. and oh. You look at those wins as a pro, he finishes the vast majority of his opponents, like 90% of his pro wins inside the distance. He is the cage warrior uh, bantamweight champion currently. He won a vacant title his last time out. Thing is, though, Paul, is that one, his defensive grappling I don't think is there. I think if Laplace wants to take him down, he will take him down. If Lokren wants to come forward and try to strike with Laplace, again, he's going to be like a, a super high advanced version of a William Gomez. He, he moves, but he strikes. He counters well. I think he minds his P's and Q's, and he does what he has to do. Lokren's record looks good, but this is his, his pro debut, which is only three years ago. Laplace was caught in the UFC with a 3-1 and one winning record four years before Lokren even turned pro. But his pro rec his pro debut, the guy's 0-31. His I second know. pro fight, the guy's, the guy's 0-39. Then he fights a 3-5, and five, an 0-0, and 0, a 1-0. And, and his last three opponents look good. Here's the thing. The one guy that was 5-0 and hasn't fought again since. So how good was he? Yeah. The Luke Shanks, 10-3. and Luke Shanks is 10-4. He hasn't fought again since. Only a year ago. Hasn't fought again since. And obviously, this Dylan has in his last time out. Again, the, the guy just hasn't fought again. So are these guys going to go on and prosper and be good fighters and those will be good wins? Or are these, they look like good wins because they fought nobody and it's the European regional scene. Now you're jumping from that in against a guy that appears to be also coming from the European regional scene, but he's not. He's a, he's a world-class talent. And at 31, I just don't think he's that old. Would I have liked to have seen him in the UFC three years ago? Yeah, why wasn't he? I hear he's got some injuries. I hear he's a tad banged up, but I think he wins this fight. So I, I got to go with Taylor Lopez. Yeah, that seems all fair. Actually, I was like, while you're talking, I was like looking up his first two pro wins. And 
Tapology has like this disclaimer for <laughs> yeah. Reese, yeah. a nightmare on Elm Street, which I, I, I appreciate that nickname. That is a great nickname. Uh, it says this fighter was found by, ta- uh, by Tapology to have engaged in activity that does not conform with combat sports standards. He purposely participated in bouts with no, p- no reasonable path to victory, displayed a lack of competitive effort, is an- and is unjustifiably matched against much more skilled opponents. He is 0-40 at this point in his career, and uh, Carnage Will Cairns is 1-42. So, I mean, he's 8-0, but let's face it. I mean, you could have thrown me or you into there, and it would have been probably yeah, the same yeah, result. He, he, Give me six right, weeks of sprawl right. training. <laughs> I'll go in there, get knocked out in the first round, collect $1,000, and head off to the pub. Like, that's what it sounds like happened in these previous two fights. Ta- Label is 3-1 and one in the UFC getting cut, and then big wins on the regional scene. You're right. You actually sold me on it. It's like... It, it, the kid he's taking on is undefeated. It's it's all well and good, but like this is a big step up for him uh, in this matchup against a proven veteran in Taylor Lapolis, who is fighting in front of his home crowd. So it all kind of adds up to a uh, justifiable favorite in Taylor Lapolis there. Moving on down, we've got An- uh, Angelusa taking on Reese McKee. Angelusa, a minus 170 favorite. McKee can be had for plus 150. Before we came on the show, we were talking about the, the prize picks there. You said, it sounds like you think, you know, Reese McKee struggles at wrestling. Angelusa, not particularly a wrestler, but he can mix in a little bit. We've seen that he's got a, a developing, well-rounded skill set, one and a half takedowns. It sounded like you liked the, liked the over on Angelusa there. Yeah, I, I, I like the overall Nanjalusa. He seems to, be, again, be a smart fighter. He's out of a, one of the top gyms in the world. He kills. He, he's with the Kill Cliff FC crew, and he's been in the gym for a while now. He came over from Europe, from Switzerland, and it kind of had that European kickboxing base already. They've just added a whole lot of new wrinkles to his game. So you see him on his last fight before he comes to the UFC. Or I guess, he yeah, so he fights Jack uh, Della Maddalena on the Contender Series. And like, whatever, he lost as a slight favorite because people expected lots of him. It just so happens that Madeleine is a pretty decent fighter in his own right. But Jack Madeleine since then has pretty much destroyed everybody. I know for, uh, his last time out against uh, Hafez Baez. Yeah, Basil, Basil oh, yeah. Hafez, the GOAT. Should have got the that that, there, that that guy came. That guy showed up with his dancing shoes and he'd gone out there and he did the, he did the salsa. He took some crazy shots, though. The referee could have stopped the fight. He just so happened to be super tough. For the most part, though, Madalena hurts everybody. And Angelusa took really all of his best shots. He just really couldn't get anything going in that fight. His next fight against John Howard, though, that's when I first saw him. this guy can wrestle. Clearly, they've been working on his grappling. He could have stood and traded with John Howard, but why bother? And he went out there and he leaned on him. He took him down. He fought a very effective game plan. So a loss to Munir Lazez. He never really quite got going. The win over AJ Fletcher. Again, you see him, what he can do. A generalist, very much a generalist. He's not a great striker. He's not a great wrestler. Just someone that's able to blend it all together quite nicely and put together effective game plans. Against Riz McKee, I think he does exactly that. McKee's big. He's long. He's got a big reach. Those are kind of his natural physical attributes, his physical tools. The thing is, he's never fought like a tall fighter. His jab is, is, is he's not great at finding range. He's not great at fighting from the outside. That jab gets countered all day long. It's the biggest thing is because he's tall and he has that frame, his takedown defense just, it ain't there. Now, here's another guy that fought in the UFC once upon a time, got caught, reinvented himself, and has come back. But unlike Taylor Lapolis, he went 3-1 and and looking good as a decent prospect. He went 0-2 in the UFC. He took a hell of a bad fight against Kamzat Chimaev, so we will not fault him for that one. But clearly, clearly grappling not up to snuff for someone of that level. Uh, the next fight with Alex Morono, though, more concerning because Alex Morono almost never wrestles in any of his fights. He has a BJJ black belt, but he's a banger. He bangs. He stands in front of people and he throws down to the crowd's excitement. And that fight with Riz McKee, he was doing it here and there. And at some point he got frustrated and said, you know what? I'm going to threaten a takedown for the first time ever. I think it's his first completed takedown in a span of like 10 fights. 10 fights he hadn't even tried to take down. And he took down Riz McKee three times in that fight and beat the absolute crap out of him. So McKee is a fan favorite. He's an entertainer. You're going to get your money's worth because he's going to go out there and try to finish or or lose trying. But when he jumps up off the regional scene level, that's where he's struggling. That's where he's running into trouble. And I think with Andrelusa, I think he could take Riz McKee's best shots. 
if Riz is able to, you know, have some success standing early, I think loses chin and his durability will check out. Yeah, but he'll, he's going to return fire. He's got nasty leg kicks, which is another very effective weapon against a tall opponent. I think he uses the leg kicks. I think he uses his slight speed advantage, keeps tight, keeps crisp, mixes in those takedowns, and wins this fight. So probably by a decision, uh, McKee is tough. You know, he's there, he's there to take those shots if need be. And Angelusa is more of a decision guy. He minds his P's and Q's. He doesn't put himself in bad spots. He also doesn't want to gas, so he's not going to put his foot on the pedal. So Angelus, Angelus by, by decision. I like it. I like where your head's at there. Um, yeah, the only he's giving up like four inches of reach here. I think yeah, everybody mixing, does mixing in key, but... mixing in that wrestling is going to be huge for Angelusa. The only thing, and you know, I haven't done this in a long time, but Angelusa, Cody, since um twenty six tw since twenty sixteen, basically. So he was what four and oh, five and oh, and then he's went back and forth with wins and losses ever since then. He's due for a loss here. Due for a loss. I mean, it's a totally different matchup than it was against A.J. Fletcher, but I was on Ange Lusa against A.J. Fletcher. A lot of people were saying that A.J. Fletcher was going to have the wrestling uh, advantages there because he was you know, coming from a, a football background and yada, yada, yada. And we kind of saw that that wasn't true. It was an absolute banger of a fight. But Reese McKee's wrestling has been absolutely exploitable. Maybe he shores it all up and maybe Angelusa isn't able to do it. If he hangs out at range, it's going to be a little bit more of a difficult fight. But uh, I trust Angelusa to get the job done here. Um, yeah, over one and a half takedowns will be added to my prize picks card this week. Moving on down, we got Jocelyn Edwards taking on Nora Cornol. You're a cornhole? I got I, what what is the name here? Um Cornoli? Corn Cornoli? Yeah, uh, uh Jocelyn Edwards minus one ten or it's minus one ten. It's a straight pick 'em. Cornhole versus uh Edwards. Who you got? Yeah, so this is a spot where you probably get diced on some crappy decision and wish you just took the hometown fighter, but you end up taking Jocelyn Edwards sheerly because of experience. And again, that's I think that's where I'm kind of at. No, Nora Cornoli comes from a French Muay Thai background, you know, fought as an amateur. No, no real like at accolades to speak about but certainly a competent stand-up fighter in mma she lost her debut against jacqueline calvaconti who we'll talk about in a couple fights she's also on the card but then since then like she just hasn't fought anybody paul so like how good is she and that that's kind of what i'm struggling with here is that her last fight in against hasna gabber maybe that was one of her better opponents and she just blows her knee out with like a sidekick so she's got some decent kicks she's got some decent muay thai i just don't really know how good she is all around it seems to me from watching prior fights that again somewhat of a lower output fighter and she seems to like to punch herself into the clinch so she's not looking to dance around the outside throw extended combinations and outwork you that way she's looking to land a couple shots into the clinch and a lot of muay thai fighters are comfortable in the clinch right they're going to try to utilize short little knees short little elbows weigh on their opponents that seems to be where she's at her most comfortable jocelyn edwards yeah Whenever you watch her, dude, it ain't it ain't pretty. It ain't pretty because the fights are generally close and competitive. She has a lot of good stuff. She does a whole lot of bad stuff. But she's doing a whole lot, and that's the one thing I do like about her. You can look at certain fights like the Roman Pasquale fight. Terrible opponent, but still better than everything that Cornoli's fought to this point in her career. But in that fight, she lands 164 significant strikes. Her fight with G and Kim, she won a split decision there. She lands 101 significant strikes. Her last time out against Luzi Putalova... Not super high output. She had given up the two takedowns, but still did outwork her 56 to 39. She's strong in the clinch. She's had, you know, trouble making weight at times in her career. Like, I think she is going to be naturally maybe the slightly bigger body, but I think you can't take away from the fact that she's had six fights in the UFC, right? And in two of those, she's landed over 100 significant strikes. So she's seen more. She's done more. It's an even money pick. And one of them, you actually know what you're going to get. The flip side of that, Cornoli, is the undercard. She's the ace. Who knows what she's going to bring to the table? You know that she can't strike, and you know that she favors the clinch. It appears, at least on tape, that both of those advantages are actually going towards Edwards, but not by much. Linemaker has it even. The fight's going to decision. The fight's going to be close. You need the French judges to get it right. And that's a lot easier said than done sometimes. So, do you... Do, 
were you planning on investing on this fight beyond you know a small little stab or or a or a spot late in the PRP? Probably not a whole lot of investment. Going to be close, going to be competitive, and I think it's going to be subjective. I like the fight to go the distance, like the over two and a half. If I was going to take one of them, I would probably try to juice it with them by decision. But it's also, you know, it's also a fairly low level MMA fight. Anything could happen. So is it a guarantee it goes to 15 minutes? No. But I, I'm given the fact that Jocelyn Edwards is just like a decision in every single fight. Six fights in the UFC, all to decision. She can take a punch. She can give a punch. Just even if she lands 140 on you, girls like Ramona Pasquale are still standing after it. So to me, the, the, the biggest thing is she's fought at 145 pounds and 135 pounds. And then this fight with Cornoli is at 104 or is at uh 135 so mm -hmm. i'm expecting edwards to be a little bit bigger therefore a little bit stronger therefore she should have a little more success in those clinch spots and that range maybe just lands the heavier shots and probably the more volume but we need the judges to get it right <laughs> yeah. so official pick jocelyn edwards but honestly paul your guess is as good as mine yeah i think the best play is significant strikes over 67.5 for uh jocelyn edwards this guy, I like that. I, I, like lo that. I love that. I think that's like, mm. I mean, you look at her previous fights. If you think that this is going to be a 15-minute striking affair between the two of them, for the most part, maybe there's a little bit of grappling mixed in. Um, 67.5. It's like she's cleared that like before the beginning of the third round in a couple of her fights. Uh, Lucy Pudilova was, there was, Lucy was trying to wrestle a whole bunch in that fight. So yeah. she didn't get over that total. But yeah, Ji Yoon Kim, she got to 101. Uh, Ramona Pasquale. Now the the striking is not going to be remotely comparable to that. Who was just like a sitting duck, but 164. Like she absolutely crushed that number. So um, 67.5 seems very, very, very feasible for her. I don't want to step in the way of French judges and their girl cornhole. So get me out. I will not be betting that fight. But Edwards will be the pick for me as well. We got Farid Basharat taking on Clayton Rodriguez. Farid is a minus one or sorry, 350 favorite. Clayton can be half a plus 290. Who you got? So the only possible thing I can think of, two possible things that I could think of, is one, they're really trying to push Fight Pass for some reason. And that this is the whole card on Fight Pass because it's from France. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if not, is it is it the whole thing? Uh I at least I'm sure it's different. I mean for, for regions, Canada, yeah. yeah right. I bet you in can I think the was the Singapore card on TV in Canada. No, they do that a couple times every year. I feel it's like they're probably going to do it again SPN. to us here because, like, this feels like a card so that too. like that like TSN won't care about. Well, the, the U.S. broadcast is ESPN Plus, so you'd have no problems there. But exactly. again, if you're in Canada, sometimes TSN won't pick it up, especially because this starts at noon and they've got some soccer game or some baseball game, which. The sad reality of it College is that the football. Blue Jays are going to draw. Yeah, that's going to draw so much bigger than this card. So 100%. It's probably, it's probably a fight pass card. Okay. If it's not a fight pass card, then you only get like the first two fights are usually fight pass, then it jumps over. That makes sense to put Fareed Basharat and Clayton Rodriguez there because you're trying to sell subscriptions. Ooh. The other thing is you'd have to check this out. I don't know what time it is in Afghanistan, but there's giant, giant market for MMA fans out that way. And I would think that Fareed Basharat is trying to appeal to some type of different demographic because there's no way that this should be the second fight on this. Let call. me interrupt you for a second. Programming note, Aaron Braunstetter, he's always on the case, works for TSN. Um, My guy, good a guy. heads up for our Canadian viewers that UFC Paris will air exclusively on UFC Fight Pass in Canada. There are a handful okay. of off-prime events that are exclusive to UFC. So basically, it's like TSN doesn't really care about this yeah. card. You better have Fight Pass if you want to tune in and you're in Canada. But like 90% of our viewers live in the States, so they are uh, tuning in on ESPN Plus, probably business as usual. Sorry, I interrupted you for that uh no okay notice. okay so so this this show starts at noon eastern time zone which i just checked mm -hmm. noon eastern is 8 30 p.m in afghanistan and then he's the second fight which would be 9 p.m in afghanistan that makes sense and, and and i know and i know people are saying like man you know afghanistan like how much of a market there i'm gonna tell you this right i booked this guy below mayan he fought uh in a show called btc right and he fought and he wins the first round and then probably by the second or third day that he had fought, before the promotion actually released the footage, 
he released the footage, somehow got a hold of it. I don't even know how. It has like 31,000 views on it. And then the next day, somebody had taken that and put it on another YouTube channel. And it also had 30,000. And then it was on a third one. And it was like, I seen it on all these, because I had him uh, on Facebook. So he's like tagged in this stuff. It's all these forum boards. It's like, if you're from Afghanistan, they will support the shit out of you. They're right. Diehard fans, loyal fans. Free Bashra looks like the real deal, man. I, I, I really like this kid. He's 26 years old. He moves extremely well. He's got good striking. He's at still at the point of his career where you would consider him a generalist, but he's already moving to those advanced generalist stages. His wrestling is getting a lot better. Training in Las Vegas with his brother. Jake Shields is taking them under their wing. Wrestling, grappling is getting good. Counter-striking is solid. The output could be a little bit higher, but again, when you have high ring IQ, you're not necessarily interested in getting into an entertaining fight for the crowd and slugging it out. You pick your shots, and guys that pick their shots tend to be lower volume. Will you get screwed on a decision eventually? Yeah, you will. Will some of your fights be close? Yes, they will. But he's a winner. 10-0 is a pro. I like what I see out of him. He was on the contender series against that Alan Bogoso. Wins a clean decision. Debuts against Damon Blackshear. A little bit of criticism from people there that he didn't look great against Damon Blackshear. But think about how good that win yeah, has, has well. aged. Mm -hmm. Blackshear's legit. He's a BJJ black belt with solid victories. Striking is ever improving and probably should have beat Mario Batista, which would have been a career point for him. It probably breaks him in as a top 15 contender in the UFC. So Blackshear's legit. And from Basharat, again, still only 26 years old, sky's the limit for him. That was a great fight. You learn a ton from that fight. You come back, you get better. Clitson Rodriguez, meanwhile, he's supposed to be a 25er. He just can't quite make 125. So mm. he fought Shannon Ross, who's just the absolute worst. And he weighs in at 127, right? So he misses the limit by one pound. When guys miss with like three pounds, three and a half pounds, it's like maybe it's a medical issue. Maybe they just got to a certain level and they just decided I don't want to. But when you're within a pound, you tried. You tried the best of your ability. You just couldn't do it, right? So he beats Shannon Ross, but it's marred by the weight miss. Then they book him against Tatsuda Tyra, and he comes in at 129 pounds. And Tyra's like, I'm not even going to fight this guy. Misses weight for the second straight time. So this happened to Ray Borg. Ray Borg is a flyweight. In fact, Ray Borg was a great flyweight. Thing is, Ray Borg actually wasn't a flyweight at all. He couldn't make the weight. So they forced him up to 35 because as you miss weight twice in a row, it's like an automatic, you need to go up. And he would go up, and like Ray Borg was world class, so like he could be competitive here and there at 35. The guy was actually... An, absolute animal just like never really got his career going in the direction it should have but like Clayton Rodriguez he he needs to figure out how to get to 125 because again he's got a whole lot of talent I like his striking I think that he, he has solid counters he should have won the CJ Vergara fight he did a decent enough performance just wasn't quite enough I guess like Vergara just marched forward kind of a bullshit decision as far as I'm concerned but he was like a minus 550 favorite and he got backed up the entire time his his wrestling his grappling wasn't there he couldn't neutralize them he had a whole lot of trouble against a rugged 125-pound fighter. So now that they're forcing him up to 135, that Arnie itself is going to give him some problems, but he's taking on Fareed Basharat. And again, it's striking. It's kind of like that, that traditional shoot-to-box Brazilian style, flat-footed, heavy on the low kicks, head straight up in the air, high guard. A guy like Basharat should be able to pick his shots, move to the outside, just move around the perimeter, bait him into coming to you, and find the openings and land the better shots. I also think that that upright stance will allow Basharat to get in on takedowns. Now, Clinton a great Brayu, his or sorry, Clinton Rodriguez, his takedown defense, it ain't bad. It's definitely not bad, but he's moving up a weight class. So like what you thought you knew about how he stuffed takedowns against flyweights is not how he stuffs takedowns against bantamweights. And Bashra should have that advantage as well. So I've always liked this kid. I bet him high against Blackshear. People were like, that was a sweat. And it was a sweat. It absolutely was. But the right man won. And that's a credible victory for a 26-year-old building up prospect. So, Expect the, the best things to come from him down the road, and this is going to be a solid step towards that. I agree with pretty much everything. Uh, only things I'm going to really add are Basher up by decision is like basically straight like a pick em. I've kind of learned on at this level of the fight game, I don't know if the Basherats are like finishers, unless they have like a massive grappling edge. And like Cledson's never been finished. I think he'll be able to at least hang out on bottom. I don't know if he'll get subbed. Um, so uh, I do like that as a bet. And then Basharat over 2.5 takedowns. If it goes three rounds, I would expect him to get a takedown per round. We get to three there. Maybe it's the type of situation where like Hudson's even able to get up and we get to like four or five. That would be even more fun. Um, you know, cash it earlier, but, uh, 
uh, don't mind that over on prize picks. So I'm with you. With you through thick and thin there. All right. Finally, we got Jacqueline Cavalcanti taking on Zara Farron. Minus 350 for Cavalcanti. Uh, Zara Farron can be had for plus 290. This would be a situation where, like, you'd be, you know, if we had Pat Mayo in studio, he'd talk about the Pat Mayo special. And I don't know if I could ever get on board with telling anybody to bet Zara Farron against anybody. Um, tell me about this Cavalcanti. She's a massive favorite against Farron, but who isn't? And this, I believe, is at a catch weight of 140. Is that what's going on yeah. here? Because it was yeah, originally yeah. listed as a bantamweight, but I've got, <laughs> I, I noticed today that somebody obviously called it in. It's just like, we're not doing 135. Yeah, well, I, I think that it makes sense for both of them. On one hand, I think Calva Conti can make 135. She fought her last fight against Melissa Crow now 135. But her only pro loss is by split decision in PFL against Martina Jindrova, 155 pounds. So she can kind of fight wherever, to be honest with you. Like, I just, I don't think there's a whole lot of competition in those weight classes. So fighters are usually jumping up and down. Zara Farron, she wanted to be a 45er. She was one of the UFC's few 45ers. The thing is that the division doesn't exist. So now she's forced to try to find something that works. She was initially supposed to fight Jocelyn Nunez and she came in at 147 pounds. Okay. Now mm -hmm. the fight was a catch weight of 139. So the fight is at 139. She comes in at 147 and Nunez obviously was like, yeah, we're not going to do that. So they canceled it. Then Nunez was like, let's do it at 145. Let me come in at 145 too. And I, I actually like Jocelyn Nunez. God bless her soul. She does the exact same thing for the entire fight. Every fight. She just spams overhand lefts. That's it. That's all. That's the whole show, baby. Overhand lefts all day. And Farron just sat there and ate them. So, I don't know, man. Now she's supposed to fight on... She was supposed to fight Haley Cowan on the show. Haley Cowan got hurt. Jacqueline Calvaconti's coming in. Because Calvaconti's fought as high as 155, I would think... That Calvaconti was like, let's just do it at 140. And Zara Farron was probably trying to come down to 135 pounds, which is the only weight class in the UFC. 145 doesn't exist anymore. Manny Nunes is retired. There's like, I think Big Norm. Big Norm's the only 45 on the roster, legitimately. And, and she's even saying I need to make to 135 because they're saying there's nothing for me here. So it's a dead division. So now Farron's trying to come down to a weight class she's never been able to make. Even at a catch weight of 140, you've seen her come in seven pounds overweight, eight one. Eight pounds overweight. She's not very good. Her striking super robotic. Her takedown defense and her grappling is completely non-existent. Like, what could you possibly like about her? Jacqueline Calvaconti, there's stuff to like about her. One, she's only 26. So there's, again, a fighter that looks young on paper and is young on paper. But you're going to continue to see more improvements out of her. She wins her first two pro fights, including a win over that Nora Carnoli, who we already spoke about at 145. Loses to Jindrova in PFL at 155 pounds. Well, Jindro Jindrova is somewhat of a, a veteran of that weight class because there's just nobody fighting there. But at again, had five pro fights. And it, it's an awful fight as far as I'm concerned. Maybe she won it. Split decision. Calva Conti, who's like 24 years old at the time, loses. But she's done a good job since then. She picked up a couple regional show wins. One in um, UAE Warriors. One on, I don't even know. But the win over Melissa Croden for LFA, that's a solid win, man. Melissa Croden's good. Melissa Croden's actually legitimate. In fact, she's the best girl in Canada at that weight class. Whole lot of girls turned her down as an opponent. I've tried to matchmake her on multiple of occasions, and she's chomping at the bit. She's also strong. She's fought heavier, and all of her losses are to legitimate. She's only got one other loss, but like legitimate competition. You have to be good to beat Melissa Croden. Calva Conti showed up in that fight. She looks solid to me. So again, only 26. She's getting some better training in. She's making some solid improvements. She's the bigger girl. She has a striking advantage. Farron's not suddenly going to pull some grappling out of the back pocket. If anything, Calva Conti could pull some grappling out of the back pocket. She wins this fight. Now, at some point, Pat Mayo would tell you, you don't want to be betting these kind of prices on debuting 26-year-olds mm -mm. or 5-1. and one. And he, dude, he's so right. You, you don't. You don't. But this whole card is one giant trap. Some of them, remember that game? It was called Mine. It was a mine field or just mine. You used to play it on old-ass computers. It was a click, click, click. Oh, I'm safe. Oh, I'm safe again. Bang, I hit a landmine. This card mine is sweeper. very much land. Minesweeper. Only people that are older than 30 years old will know what that is. But gangster OG original PC game that you could play pretty much everywhere because it was like a stock program on the computer. 
just like that, we're going to have to navigate a minefield for sure. Calvacanti seems like one of the pieces I'm willing to place because she's fighting Zara Fair at the end of the day. But yeah, short notice, wonky weight class, fighting her opponent in her own backyard, UFC debut, green. All of this is giant recipe for disaster. Luckily for you, you can rebuild if you lose. <laughs> yeah, I just don't want to do that. I just don't want to do that. But it is the first fight on the card, so you, you could always go degenerate on it if you needed to. For your purposes, for your PRP purposes, I feel like at least this one's first on the docket. Yeah. So if all, if all it is, I mean, kind of inspecting her a little bit deeper, like that Jindrova fight loss. Looks pretty bad on paper when you've seen what Jindrova's... I mean, Kayla Harrison, whatever. She was good. But, like, I remember watching the head kick to hammer fist against Lybrock. And, like, Lybrock yeah. is pretty low level, man. So, like... But she's big. That, she's a big gal. She's a 45. I know, but it... it and so is Zara Farron. Like, I know that... I, we're playing... I'm playing MMA, MMA math here, of course, right? But, like, that Jindrova loss in that fight to Lybrock and then Lybrock's follow-up um it does, doesn't look great doesn't look great when you're staring at a minus 350 so <laughs> yeah, yeah um yeah. prepare for the worst and in fairness is there a fair and she was a massive underdog against Josie Ann Nunes and we've talked with Josie Ann Nunes that she's super 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 short for whatever reason wants to fight at 145 pounds it's very very stocky don't get me wrong but it's like she gave up like over 10 inches of reach and just engaged in a kickboxing match um for basically the entirety of the fight so um hanging out at range trying to land big bombs but like eating jabs every single time she entered like that fight was way closer than the uh, than the odds suggested. So I mean, tr I would say tread lightly because it's minus three fifty. Like it's kind of scary for in, in that respect. You're not scared. You shook your head. You're like, she's no, no, but buddy, I, I no, I heard, I, I heard what you're saying, bro. Okay. I would not if you offered me a two to one shoey bet on this one. I thought they fair, and if you gave me a two to one shoey bet, take it. But if it was a three to one shoey bet, Paul, ah, uh, it's Zara fair, and uh, so it sounds I guess I probably would take. It. But I, nah, I just why would you do that to yourself? I want no part of this. Ooh, three to one. All right, let's do a three to one. I'll do it. I, I don't even like Zara Farron. This is producer Apparently Megan's loves fault. Zara she she's is all I'm hearing. She's saying do it, whispering uh, from the other side of the room. There, do it. We haven't done one in a while. It's the first fight of the night. I have no intentions of putting any money on it unless, like, I don't know. What's, what's fair and by decision? She is French. What is that price? Because that could be stupid. That's, like, the stupid type of prop that I, you know, consistently bet and never, never win. But I feel great about them. It's kind of like, Man, uh, she, she well, it's kind of like Nakamura plus 510 Nunes. last week by submission. Absolute. Oh, he had so many opportunities. Just couldn't get to the window. Um, oh, plus 500 by decision. I'll be your huckleberry. Uh, that's probably something that I'm gonna throw some money away on, but yeah, shoey bet three to one shoey bet. Zara Farron versus Cavalcante. You know, I, I'm uh, just gonna bite down. Are you down. I'm gonna bite down and say yes. I'm yes. gonna bite down and say yes because at the end of the day, in December, Zara Farron's turning 40, and I'm just not going to get behind her in any way, shape, or form. So if you're giving me an opportunity to be fade her in some capacity, the worst case, I'm drinking three shoeys, which is kind of gross, be but best case, I get to watch Paul drink a seltzer because the beer hurts his sensitive little tum-tum. Uh, yeah. You're all on Zara Farron. Apparently, you're all on Zara Farron. Oh, it's Paul's slick pick of the week. And now I'm now I'm now I'm questioning everything I've ever thought about mixed martial arts, but this is a low ass level card. So, so just proceed with caution and hopefully we make the right picks, have some fun with it in cash, but like traps are all over it quickly. 50.5 significant strikes for Cavalcanti. I'm thinking they both hit the over. And as much as I just shit on Zara fair, now how my brain works is I have to re go through, think my worst case scenarios. This is what I would say. Against Megan Anderson, it was like the biggest joke. They need to cut her right now. Four fight deal. Get her off the roster. She doesn't belong. And against Felicia Spencer, she kind of did a little bit better. She landed a few strikes standing. Then she got taken down and got mollywopped. Then against Josiah Nunes, she outstruck her 117 to 102. 
went to decision. She lost the decision. She looked way better. And clearly, she's a boxer. She doesn't want to grapple. She wants to box. Calva Conti is probably going to stand in front of her and do the damn thing and throw down. She's at home. She's in France. All possibilities. Thing is, pretty slapstick. Don't go with logic. Because with his heart. You know what his heart's telling him? Is there a fan? Not when a UFC fight. Not going to happen. <laughs> not going to happen now. Not going to happen ever. So I need to fade Paul Shaughnessy so I can watch him drink a seltzer out of a child's rubber boot. I feel like if it ever does happen, it'll be a decision in France. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> You're right. As the judges smell. put ha, in ha, their... Ha, ha, ha. Ha, ha, ha. Here, you smell the home cooking. Ha, ha, ha. Um, okay, quickly, prize picks, what we got here. We got... Uh, I like Benoit St. Denis, more than 44.5 significant strikes. Angelusa, more than 1.5 takedowns. Uh, Jocelyn Edwards, more than 67.5 significant strikes. Fareed Basharat, more than 2.5 takedowns. And Cavalcanti, more than 50.5 significant strikes. Only five ones that, like, made the cut this week. But uh, people come here for the PRP, Cody, so hit them with it. Well, I will just piggyback one onto Paul, the Benoit St. Denis over one and a half takedowns. I don't know if he mentioned that one, but uh, I like That's, that as yeah. far as prize picks. Yeah. So Angelusa over one and a half, Benoit St. Denis over one and a half. That's kind of what I like on prize picks. In terms of the PRP, yeah. I mean, again, favorite heavy, and this is definitely a greasy underdog type card. So we just got to figure out what the order is. But I, I honestly truly do believe this. There's lots of good plus money available. It's in the props. It's in betting these minus 150s, minus 170s, with a win condition. Nice plus money available, but you're probably going to have to prop hunt a little bit more than just rely on straight parlays. In terms of the favorites that we are going with, Cyril Gunn, Mano Fioro, Benoit Saint-Denis, Volkan Uzdemir, William Gomez. Dog number one is this Manolo Zucchini. Uh, is that a dog we love? No, but it is our dog number one. It might be our only dog for that for that matter. We are going with Taylor Lapolis, Angelusa, Jocelyn Edwards is kind of an even money pick, wash both sides, Free Basharat, and Jacqueline Calvaconti. So, 11 fights, you think it's going to go 10 favorites in an underdog? Probably not. Uh, it'd be nine favorites and even money pick in an underdog. Probably not. But at the same time, the lines have been fairly steamed. The underdogs have gone, or the favorites have gone in one big direction, which is why you're seeing three or four of these minus 300 range type fighters. It's just like, which one is going to shit in the apple pie? So lots to think about. I definitely want to make sure I put the right order together. And the fights start at noon Eastern Standard Time, right? So you're going to probably want to get these picks in the night before or like, you know, early in the morning. So you don't accidentally miss out on anything. That's about it, man. I can't really leave you with anything else. I can see myself trying to chase some of these bigger underdogs on something like tout master, just because I'm 10 points back with four months left. Like I probably need to start making a couple bolder moves here and there, but I'm also sitting like fourth or fifth place. So it's kind of like you're right in that threshold where it's like, I need to balls up and go for it, but also get the right picks. This card, I think we've got the right picks, but we're going to need everyone to do their part, do their job. And we're also going to need French cooking, voulez-vous coucher avec moi, to be on point. And like, I don't know if I feel safe about that. So we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens Saturday morning. It's going to be fun regardless. Uh, just, yeah, yeah. I'll put it the PRP when I have a better idea after weigh-ins of who we're going to lock in and go with. And you are back on the X. And so. I'm back on the X, thanks to, to Matt Lee. And apparently Pat Mayo talked to Matt Lee. So thank you to Pat Mayo for help facilitating it. And uh, thank you for, yeah, all the like fans that and for me Elon, up and said that they wanted for me back. Elon and, for hearing all the rallying cries, telling people to, or, you know, I'm sure Elon took Elon, time out of his busy schedule. to be like, the people need the PRP. Sort it out, guys. All right. I'll, I'll admit, dude, Elon is somewhat Canadian. Not born here, lived here for a little bit. Not born here, don't live here currently. But he does have a citizenship. He's somewhat Canadian. So I've always taken Elon as one of my own. And then Goofy Dude looks funny. Seems like a likable guy. I don't know if he drinks beer, but like I'd love to have a beer with him. I, I, he just seems like a quirky, kind of cool guy. Then the meme lord thing, funny. The crypto coin stuff, not my thing, but whatever. I'm nothing against him. Zuckerberg, he stole the idea. He's... A career loaf. Everybody seemingly doesn't like the guy. He like puts all these things in place, this and that, this and that. I never envisioned a world, Paul, where I would hope that my boy Elon would get his ace kicked by Mark Zuckerberg. But I'm telling you something. Elon did nothing to help me out. It was Pat Mayo and Matt Lee. That's it. That's the only reason I'm back on Twitter slash X. 
And uh, yeah, shout out to those guys. Happy to be back. X gonna give it to you. All right, that is it for us this week. Hope you enjoyed the show. For producer Megan and Cody Saptic, I'm Paul Shaughnessy saying goodbye and good luck. (laughs) 